Hi, today's good person to know is Kirit Patel, MBE. He's founder and CEO of Day Lewis, a retail pharmacy chain that he started over 40 years ago. Kirit said, if you want something, you've got to believe in yourself and you've just got to go for it. And that's exactly what he did when age 25, he set up his first pharmacy. He grew the business to 32 branches, but then the recession hit in the 1980s and Kirit realised that his business wasn't performing as well as he had hoped. His mentor at the time told him to do an MBA course, which he did, and he realised that he had to scale back the business from 32 to just 8 and that he needed to change the culture in his business. This is a really inspirational video of Kirit's entrepreneurial journey where he's learned many lessons along the way and throughout this video you'll hear his tips such as the importance of having a mentor, the importance of rewarding your staff so that they become loyal, the importance of being a risk taker not just in business but in your personal life as well and how to overcome obstacles and to grow your business. So I hope you enjoy this video and thank you for watching. I remember when I was young, I used to buy and sell comics, war comics, you know, dandy, and make some money on the side. That was the first lesson I learned in entrepreneurship, that you have to have a want. You have to have a desire, because wishes do not bring riches. I also realized that if you want something, you really need to work for it. My father had promised me a bicycle when I passed my 11 plus but he couldn't keep his promise, and I understood. So a few years later, I bought a broken bicycle from a barber's son. It cost me 50 shillings, probably about a fiver uh, today's money. I had about 10 shillings of my own life saving, which I gave him, borrowed 15 for my sister. And the rest, I did what you now call vendor finance. So that was my first experience of leverage. In the boarding school, I learned many things. I always remember asking my housemaster for permission, because I used to ask my father every time I wanted to do something. So to me, I replaced the housemaster. He one day told me, Patel, he says, I am not your father. Just do what you want. If you think it's right, just do it. That was my second lesson. Just make a decision. Just if you want to do something, just decide and do it. If you get it wrong, just start again and just get on with it. No point just hanging around and and taking a long time to believe it's right, follow your gut feel and just make it. Sometimes you get it wrong, but on the whole, I believe, you get it right. At the age of 25, um, I bought my first pharmacy. It was a pharmacy and a little satellite pharmacy in a town called Southborough. I used networking to help me find the shop, and also then, the way I financed the business was with my second leverage deal. I got the owner to give me a credit back. A friend of ours, is a kind of a handshake guarantor, he said, look, carry it, good for it, well, he'll pay, don't worry. And I used that money as my deposit and I borrowed the balance from the NetWest Bank. So I had a 100% leverage business and I knew I had to work very hard. So I really worked hard because I had to pay the interest. When I was young, I was, um, I was working for my father in my holidays. I was working alongside uh, the African servants in Kenya. And I saw my father, the way he respected and treated them with, with dignity and respect. And you know, in the colonial days, it wasn't quite common. And I learned, really, that if you respect people who work for you, they respect you back. My father was a very hardworking man. But one thing he couldn't give me was time. So I promised myself, when I get older, I will make time for my family and my wife. And I believe um, that's another lesson. But if you want to be successful, you really need to support your wife. The last thing you want to do is have hassle at home and then someone who doesn't understand you. I believe you should work smart, not hard. I call it an 80-20 rule, and I'm always teaching my children. Always use your head 80% of your time. Never use your hands more than 20. Because nobody's going to think for you but you can employ a thousand pairs of hands to work for you. Delegation is key if you want to succeed. I came across a book that influenced my life. The title was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. That book was written 78 years ago. Napoleon Hill interviewed 500 
rich men, including Andrew Carnegie. And he came up with this 13 principles of what makes people successful and rich. And I practice every one of those. The most, most important one on, in that one was a positive mental attitude. You don't have necessarily to be born with it. You know, you could acquire it. It's a mindset that you just acquire. Once you start telling yourself what you want, what you're gonna do for it, and you will get it, you believe it, you believe in yourself. It's all a mindset. And so, entrepreneurs don't think negative. One of the um, principles I followed, and next thing I know, I started growing my shops. By 1988, 86 onwards, I had 32 shops. And that's when we had the recession. And the chancellor kept the interest rate at 14%. I did not realize I was in trouble and I couldn't pay my bills. My pharmacies apparently didn't make as much money as I thought they were making because I had very bad dashboards. No financial knowledge, I was a pharmacist dabbling in business. At the time, I had a mentor, an elderly Jewish gentleman by the name of Monty Cohen. I used to refer to him as Monty Bai. And I would go to him with all my troubles. I remember the 87 crash. We had 100,000 pound invested in the stock market. And I said, what do I do? The broker's picking the points, like, make your mind up, what do you want to do? Uh, I want advice, bang, phone went down. 87 was the worst period. What he said to me, and I never forget, he said, if you had 30,000 pounds today, would you invest in the stock market? I said, no. There's your answer. So I learned that day, never throw good money after bad. What's gone is gone. What you got, that's all you got. And make your decision. I never regret. I cashed in my 30,000 pound and I started buying pharmacies with that. Another lesson I call a Monte Coin lesson. Anybody ever comes to you with a bargain and says to you, unless you sign it now, I got somebody else interested. You know what you do? You turn around and you run as fast as you can. With no formal qualification, I was struggling. One day, Monty Bai filled us in. He was an MBA course at Polytechnic of Central London. He got me admission. MBA, I learned, it's not just a business degree. MBA is the greatest personal development program that you'll ever come up with. If you look at every single module, it applies very little to your business in time-wise. And I believe MBA really makes you a better person. So I realized when I left in 88, I knew what I had to do. I had to deleverage. I had to deleverage very cleverly because our suppliers, only one supplier, Unicam was supplying my goods and if they got wind that I'm having a problem, they'll stop supply straight away. So we had to sell shops slowly. Within two years, I had to sell everything but eight shops. And I realized I got it wrong. I had a wrong structure, top-down, autocratic, no management control. I focused on building a culture in my business. It made a difference to our business. Because I believe people are not loyal to a company. It's fallacy to think people are loyal to a company. People are only loyal to an individual. From 95, after having licked my wounds, I started buying pharmacies again. After focusing on people, we grew. And by 2007, I had 175 shops. Another bombshell. The NHS did a research into profits that pharmacy were making. They realized the pharmacy was making a billion pound. So on October 1st, 2007, they withdrew 480 million pounds out of pharmacy as a whole. I had just bought 41 shops that year in a warehouse, fully automated. I bought 30 of the shops from Boots when they had to divest because of the merger with Unicam. I didn't even make the profit. I was paying 40% of other people's profit back. So we had three options. Sell out completely, sell half, or hang in there and do something about it. We decided what we will do is we will go for a recovery. After years of promising myself, I went back to Wharton. This was my third time back in uni, having gone to Brighton in 93 to 95 to do an advanced management development program. Wharton 
was another experience. When lecturers after lecturers come and lectured me, professors come in, I'm analyzing my business. I came back with 92 action points. I came back in April, having just bought those bootstraps. Then we had to pay back six million pounds. We had to pay half a million pounds a month. I wrote to every single staff at the home address, explaining to them what had happened and why they must help me turn the business around. And we as a family put a house up, borrowed some money and some from the bank, and put three million in. Within one year, the people brought back 3.3 million. It just shows when you look after people in a good time, they pay back. As we grow now, we have about two and a half thousand people working for us. And to avoid mistakes, I gotta bring people in who've been where I'm going. So I go and recruit in the corporate world, but they come back with baggage. They come back with the corporate culture, with a stick. And in my business, nobody carries a bigger stick than me, and I don't have one. What else did I learn in, at college? It's lateral thinking, thinking out of the box. That drives innovation. Because we realized, after I did my study, that when Porter said competitive advantage, how can I have a competitive advantage with, against boots? They have mega machinery and they buy cheaper than I can sell it for. It became very obvious, the people. Because the prescription medicine that you get in their pharmacy, whether it's Ventolin or the Biopenadol, is no different to the ones you get in our pharmacy. So where is the differentiation going to come from? It's very obvious. What value added we can give? And who puts the value addedness there? Who gives the advice, the smile, the people? The gain it comes down to people. When I bought the boot shops, I had four years debt left. And I borrowed 35 million to buy the shops, another five million to buy the property. 40 million pound was the biggest leverage I ever done in that one year. The banks were throwing money at you giving me loan at 1% over base. It's so damn cheap, you know, you just can't resist taking it, just throwing money, and that before the credit crunch. And then what happens? We get a credit crunch a year later. So in the height of the credit crunch, we had to take our property portfolio elsewhere, we had to take a half our business elsewhere, but because I was fortunate that our business was pharmacy was doing well, it's the banking that had a problem. It was the cash that dried up. We managed, after a lot of costs, to refinance our business with a syndicate of banks. That was two and a half years ago. But I had to pay a price. You keep hearing about these interest swaps. I had to buy one. I was told that that's one way that I can have some money. This cost me three million pounds a year in interest charges. I learned that day, read the small prints. Currently, a project to sell is now 300 million. I mean, probably make about Going forward next year will be about 350. Profits of about 30 million. And we are refinancing our business again, but this time for a better reason. We need money to buy shops now. We've got 280 now. We want to get up to 400 by 2020. But we realize one thing, don't put your eggs in one basket. No one is too big to fail. Entrepreneurs, like I said to you, always surround themselves with people who know more than them. Don't ever think that you know everything. You don't. You always have someone that you turn to because you're never good at everything. I also learned to balance the risk and reward. I am a risk taker. There's a big difference between taking risk and gambling. And when I take risk, I calculate my downside. I know exactly what I'm going to lose, and I got to have a much more upside. But to do that, you have to do it in your personal life too. You know, you got to take risk. If you can't, if you're risk averse in your social life you'll never take business risk. So to be an entrepreneur, you need to make sure you are willing to take risk socially. So what do I do? Well, I practice it. I push myself beyond boundaries. My children, my wife and me, we climbed the Kilimanjaro. I'm telling you, that was one tough cookie. I've come a long way. Many people have helped me. Some I know, some I don't even know. Some I can't remember. But all I know is that unless I do what Monty Bai did to me, he was a busy man himself making time for me. When you are successful, pay back. And then you hope that those people pay back in the future. What I most liked about Kirit's talk was the fact that he was
talking frankly about all the problems that he'd encountered and what he had to do in order to get out of it. But more importantly, how he treated his staff and why his staff were so willing to help him at his time of need. So I hope you enjoy this video. Please subscribe to see more and thank you for watching.